So excited to see you all here um, at the first ever Agape Latte. Do you feel like you made history? Um, so in early February, four students went with Evelyn Quinn to Boston College to witness... Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> four students went with Evelyn Quinn to Boston College to witness an Agape Latte live. Um, our students were amazed, um, astounded at the response from their campus, and we knew right away that it had to come here. Um, we are the first Mercy campus to be doing this, which is kind of exciting. All right. Dr. Joseph M. Marbach became Georgia Court's ninth president on July 1st, 2015. He is the first male and first lay president in Georgia Court's history. Dr. Marbach possesses a distinguished background in the academic arena as both an educator and leader. He grad graduated from LaSalle University in 1983 and, sorry, and, and earned an MA and a Master of Arts and a PhD in political science from Temple University. He is the former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Seton Hall University where he also was a professor and former chair of the Department of Political Science. During his years at Seton Hall, Dr. Marbach was a frequent media contributor and subject matter expert for television, radio, newspaper, and magazine outlets. In 2010, he was named Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at LaSalle University. His work appears in numerous journals and encyclopedias. An award-winning radio analyst, he is often asked to share his experience in state and local government. His areas of expertise include federalism and intergovernmental relations, state and local government, and New Jersey politics. He has a wife, Paula, and has three children. Please join me in giving Dr. Marbach a warm welcome. Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate this opportunity to be your guinea pig at Agape Latte. Um, I, I, when I was presented this opportunity, I thought, well, they had the bar pretty low because as you heard from Nick, I can't hold the job for very long and keep moving on. So I didn't know if that's what you wanted me to talk about. But um, really, what I thought this was a great opportunity for me to continue a conversation that I wanted to start, and I think we have started, uh, as I was inaugurated. And part of that was transforming education through Catholic higher education. And one of the key elements of that is this notion of vocation. And I'll, I'll come to that, but to get to that story, I have to take you on a circular journey. Um, and when I started to present this story to the to the board of Agape Latte, they they said, "Well, you talk about that. How you got to be an administrator? If that's your calling, how'd you get to be an administrator?" And really, that's the story of an accidental administrator. On a Thursday night in February of 2006, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences called me into her office sat down and for some reason I had my son with me and we were I must have been babysitting and and visiting and so he sat in the outer office and I sat in the Dean's office and she's Joe I really need you to become my associate Dean and I'd been asked before to be the associate Dean I'd been asked to be an administrator and the College of Arts and Sciences was in a little bit of trouble up at Seton Hall they had lost a number of, of key associate deans uh, the dean was, was pretty desperate. I said, well, let me think about it. You know, give me the weekend, I'll think about it. We're going down the shore. Uh, my wife's parents lived in Dennis Township, which if you know the Jersey Shore that far south, it's near Sea Isle. And they don't have internet access, so it's always, it was always a nice break to go visit them. And so we left that Friday. I didn't have a teaching schedule, so we were gonna spend a long weekend. We spent a Friday, talked about it made some decisions and I said alright I feel comfortable my wife is very supportive uh, she said you know if this is the next phase of your career if this is what you need to do then go ahead and do it because up to that point I'd spent a lot of time uh, as part-time Mr. Mom the, the, the teaching profession is wonderful 
if you you know you're in the class three days a week and I'd be there three days a week and I got to spend two days a week with my my two children and at this point she was uh, she had just delivered my youngest Madison and I was excited to help spend time with her but she said if if being an administrator is what you want to do go ahead and do it so I'm feeling real good and I'm coming in and sat Sunday night flip open the laptop and check an email and I get a slew of congratulatory notes and I'm thinking what is this all about did I hit the lottery or something the dean announced to the university on Friday that I had accepted the position <laughs> as an accidental administrator thank God I had decided to accept it I was, I was kind of boxed into a corner how did I get there was also because of a call so you're kind of answering a call who, who has called you and, and why have people called you and, and so that's the circular story I want to come back to this notion of vocation at Seton Hall we were looking at issues of raising awareness about student vocations we'd gotten a grant from the Lilly Foundation and the Lilly Foundation was interested first in promoting traditional vocations and, and they wanted Protestant vocations uh, for people to become ministers but they realized that was too narrow a definition of vocation and they expanded it and they included many faith-based institutions Seton Hall was one of them and we started to look at well what does it mean to answer a call what does it mean to find one's own vocation and so I worked with a group of faculty a group of administrators on a summer project about finding our own vocation and articulating what our own vocation was I just got to practice a bit of my vocation I've had many vocations I guess and, and I think you will too but uh, I, I was a little bit late because I was in the North Dining Hall talking to a group of students about this election uh, I'm a die-hard political science junkie I love American government I love all kinds of government but as Nick pointed out American federalism and our set federal system is something I particularly love so I got to talk about the Electoral College you know real geeky stuff I'm sure you're all interested in that and I can talk about that but that's part of the vocation and that's why I'm in higher education but in addition to being a, a scholar and being a teacher I, I seem to have a talent for administration as well and in working through this vocational exercises at Seton Hall we had to write our own story what brought us here what got us to this point in our lives what was our calling and how did we answer it and for me up to that point it was about studying government it was about understanding the single institution in society that has the greatest potential to enact change it also is the single institution in society that can completely disrupt your lives you know if you're an American you know Thomas Jefferson wrote in a declaration of independence the inalienable rights to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the one institution in our society that can take away your life your liberty and your happiness which in the 1800s was money still is today I guess for some people is government so that's why I've always been intrigued and have studied it that was part of a calling before Catholic higher education faith-based institutions allow faculty members and students and administrators to have those kinds of conversations to go beyond just what does the Electoral College mean but what does the Electoral College mean to me and is it just is it fair is what our government is doing just and right and fair and how does it relate to me so one of the questions I got was was absolutely great I talked about the Electoral College and how undemocratic it is and a student raised his hand and said so you're saying I shouldn't vote for president because it doesn't matter and I said no 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 it does matter it does matter it doesn't matter in terms of this map but it matters to you it matters that you participate and even though we have all these polls out and even though we have all these uh, uh, tracking that's going on and we know who's likely to win it still matters to participate 
because it matters not only at the presidential level, but it matters at the congressional level, at the state level, and particularly at the local level. Get out there and vote. I can have that kind of conversation. I can have a conversation with someone because we went to Dublin and we went to Baggett Street, the house that Catherine built, and learned about her life and learned about how she overcame tremendous obstacles in an era when women were literally second-class citizens to build you know, what was and what is a tremendous influence worldwide with regard to that mercy mission. And we can have that conversation. You can't have that at other kinds of institutions. You, certainly not public institutions. The separation of church and state is too great. Faculty members can't have those kinds of conversations with their students. That's taboo. You can't talk about what moves you, what's part of your spirituality, what's part of your faith. We can have that here. And it's what I find so valuable and invigorating about Catholic higher education. And so I, I've, I've had another calling then, not only to be a political scientist and a teacher and scholar, but now to be an administrator. And there have been inflection points uh, in my life throughout that. I'll give a little bit of that journey, how, how it kind of moved through the, the hierarchy. But I believe that at, behind it all is um, a voice, and it's the, it's the Holy Spirit. I, I got to talk to the board of Agape Latte students, and, and I told them, you know, I'm a real fan of the Holy Spirit. I, I find the Holy Spirit really tangible and something that I can wrap my arms around and, and something I think that wraps its arms around me. I don't want to be gender specific on whether the Spirit's a male, female, the Spirit's there. Other mysteries are that. I, you know, they're mysteries. Mysteries of our faith. So you try to understand them, but you can't because of the very definition is mysteries. But for me, this, I, I see the Spirit move people. And I know it's moved me in different ways. And it's been the voice that's been answering that call. So how do I end up being an administrator? Well, as a faculty member, it was good news, bad news kind of deal. Some faculty members will appreciate this. So I was given, I was awarded tenure. I wasn't given tenure, I was awarded tenure because of my scholarly work. And the chair, the then chair of my department, the outgoing chair of my department, said, congratulations, Joe. You're tenured and we're making you chair. So it was good news, bad news kinds of things. So I had to learn how to be the chair of the political science department. Um, and then as chair, I got a call from uh, a faculty member in philosophy. And she said, you know, Joe, we need you. I said, you need me for what? We need you to be the chair of the Arts and Sciences Faculty Senate. This dean is out of control. And the previous chairs have all been her puppets. And we need somebody who's willing to stand up to this dean. And I had never perceived myself as somebody who was standing up to the dean. I had uh, great success working with this dean. Um, I had effectively resisted her overture. She wanted us to create a master's program in political science, but the political science faculty at that time uh, was very much committed to undergraduate education. We found that as our primary purpose and our primary joy in why we were there. So I, frankly, we had an outside rec uh, evaluator say, you ought to have a master's program. You're really good. You're a good faculty. We said no. And I was able to manipulate the dean in different ways to get additional faculty hires. I got a minority hire, uh, first time in our department's history. I was able to bring in an environmental economist to add to the offerings in the political science department. So I guess I had developed a reputation for standing up to this dean or being able to work with this dean in, in different ways. So they made me chair of the faculty senate. Uh, it was the Arts and Sciences Senate. Very difficult time. The dean was burning bridges left and right. While I chaired that 
group of uh, arts and sciences faculty, we had three s votes of no confidence in that dean. Two of the votes were voted down by the faculty, but the third vote went through. She was, as I said, burning bridges as quickly as you could build them or try to rebuild them. Fast forward in 2005 then, early 2006, all her associate deans leave. They actually get promoted to be associate vice, pre, uh, vice provost. And she's left with nobody. And then she started collecting people. And that's what led to this call into her office to be the associate dean. And again, you hear a voice. In this case, it was the voice of my wife who said, go for it. If this is what's next in your career, if this is what you need to do to be the fullest person you can be, to complete yourself, if this is what your institution needs, then you owe it to your institution to do that. And don't worry about being Mr. Mom. We got it covered. We can handle that. Tremendous support coming from my family. That's one of those voices you hear empowering you to do something. So I, I enjoyed that support, went on to become associate dean. I was associate dean for three months. The dean of arts and sciences then left to become a provost elsewhere. There was nobody left standing. So again, I got another call. Joe, do you want to be dean? I thought, oh my gosh, talk about accidental administrator. Here I am, I didn't want to be associate provost, now I'm our associate dean, now I'm going to be acting dean. And I was hemming and hawing about it. And a colleague came to me who had been an associate dean and he got fired. He got fired because he wrote a, an editorial uh, that he took the church to task because they had created this uh, group that was essentially witch hunting. They were going through seminaries and they were rooting out gay men because they were going to be potential child molesters. And it was uh, this big hubbub. And, and this guy took, took the church to task and he signed it as the associate dean and he lost his job. Prior to that, I had delivered a, a letter to this guy because we had a, a dispute over his tenure status. And the uh, hardest letter I had written was to say, we, we don't recognize your tenure status in, in my department. But again, he was a bigger person. He understood why that was written, didn't take it personally. And he sat down with me and he said, look, do you want to be the dean? And I said, well, I'm thinking about it. He said, do you want to be the dean? If you want to be the dean, you have to go out and grab the bull by the horns. You have to tell them, the provost, the president, that you want this job. And you've got to be firm about it and decisive about it. And this was a guy I, I didn't think liked me. I, I, but he was willing to put himself on the line and offer advice because he, I think he also thought it was best for the institution. And so I heard that call and heard that voice as part of, as part of the vocation. Fast forward four years. I, I used to, I, I was, as Nick indicated, I'm an alum of LaSalle University. LaSalle brings their political science alumni back every year for a meet and greet, meet the students, maybe you can do some networking, especially the seniors, uh, any jobs out there, uh, recommendations for graduate school, law school, that sort of thing. Uh, having a conversation with the chair of the department, who was actually one of my professors from 30 years before. And he, was, he, he left academia, he came back, he was chairing the department as he was on his way out retiring, because that department had its issues chatting with him and he, he was just bemoaning the state of the university at the time and that academic rigor seemed to be ebbing away from the university and he's just Joe we got to do something we got to we got to just put 
standards back in. He said, I'm glad you're on an administrative track. You'll be able to bring those kinds of standards to Seton Hall. Three months later, the provost at LaSalle resigned and they opened the position. And I'm thinking, so I hear a voice calling me from sitting down at that conversation with uh, the chair and a student walked in and we were talking about the provost and the student walked in and said, the provost resigning? No, 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 you know, don't, don't start rumors. But sure enough, that was in the mix. So I called the chair back and I said, you know, is this, is this real? Uh, or is there somebody that they're, they're going to fast track for the position? What, what's going on? He said, that was an open search. Uh, you know, please apply and we'll, we'll, we'll see where we can go from there. So I applied and had a, had a five year run um, at LaSalle um, and we, we instituted several new programs, started uh, to expand our outreach, um, especially with underserved populations. That became one of our, our specialties, uh, especially Latino populations. We were expanding our outreach there, um, something that I'm, I'm very proud of that we launched satellite uh, campuses in Allentown and in Reading. Coming towards the end of my, my fifth year, and, I, and the Dean of Arts and Sciences at LaSalle said, so where are you going next? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, look at your track record. You don't last very long, four or five years at most. You're probably itching to get out of here. And I, I wasn't itching to get out at, at LaSalle, but I went back and I looked and yeah, sure enough, I took on a different job every four or five years uh, moving on. Um, saw an ad in the paper, Georgian Court. Uh, I knew about Georgian Court. We have that relationship, Seton Hall nursing with Georgian Court nursing. So I knew about it. I knew we had you know, a small Catholic, thought it was all girls, never gave it much of a thought. The former president at LaSalle sent me an email. And he said, take a look at this job, Joe. Brother Mike McGinnis, good friend of mine. I think you'd be a really good fit here. I didn't know anything about the Mercy Mission. I didn't know anything about the charism of, uh, of the Sisters of Mercy. I was getting very much involved in the, La the Lasallian world, uh, much more integrated into some of the hierarchies within LaSalle. Uh, but Mike McGinnis knew the Sisters of Mercy. He knew Sister Rosemary. He'd been president for 15 years. They, they overlap much of their term. So Mike said, Joe, this, this would be a good spot for you. Take a look at it. And I got to learn a little bit more about Georgian court, learn more about the charism of the mercies, the founding story of, uh, of the Lasallians and the mercies, very similar. Uh, with Lasalle, St. John Baptist de Lasalle took uh, young men off the streets of France. They were uh, illiterate, Impover impoverished kids. He brought them in, taught them how to speak French so they could operate effectively, read and write French, taught them occupations so they could become part of what would be a burgeoning middle class. We all know the story of Catherine McCauley working with the young women of Ireland, the Catholic women of Ireland who weren't getting, there were no such thing as social services, or very few, um, and and those who went to Dublin with me, we learned about the outrage that Catherine felt about uh, the Sisters of Charity in particular, who were very regimented and rigorous in when they would hear cases and not hear cases, and uh, that led to one young woman uh, uh, losing her life, and, and that inspired Catherine. And, and, and a, a, it was just a, a parallel program going on, one in France, one in Ireland. But then the icing on the cake was I doing my homework on Catherine and I read that she went to France to study the latest in pedagogical uh, offerings. The pedagogical innovations going on in France were being conducted by the Christian brothers. St. John Baptist de La Salle's Christian brothers. He was teaching large classrooms teaching students in a large seminar format. Up until that time, teaching was a one-on-one -on -one experience. You had your Latin teacher 
and that was the, you know kind of a tutor working with you. And so the Christian brothers expand this to a large classroom. Catherine McCauley takes those lessons back to Ireland. And if you ever have the opportunity to, to visit Baggett Street, you'll see in their international room this big hall where they taught 200 young children in that room. It was the link. And they said, yeah, oh yeah, Catherine went and studied the Christian brothers. And she brought back that link. That is a circle. It ties the knot. It's why I'm here. I listen to voices along the way. I asked questions, was inspired, and I appreciate the great advice that I've been given all throughout that process that led me here. I hope you will hear those voices. Undoubtedly you will. You may have had that opportunity in the classroom or outside the classroom with the wonderful faculty, staff, and administrators we have here, even with fellow students that can help you make a decision in what's the next for the course of your life. Family as supportive. Those voices are all around us. Please choose to listen to them. Be thoughtful. Find out what uh, compels you to do what you love. I've always done that and I always attempted to leave one institution better off then I found it when I got there. I think I've been fairly successful at that. Um, it's my challenge here at Georgian Court. We're, we're on an upward trajectory. I'm so excited to be here. Um, you've been a great welcoming family, not to just me and my family, but even now to our dog Casey. And I think you all know that story, and, uh, but if not, I'll tell that later. Uh, it was... Uh, it's been my great pr pleasure and privilege to have served this past year and entering my second year here at Georgian Court. So I just thank you for that embrace. And I thank you for your time to, to listen to my story. And I ask you to listen for your call, listen for your voice. Thank you.